tonight at 5.15, we meet for prayer, 5.30 for the evening service. If you come tonight, I encourage you to bring your Bible. We'll be looking at some scriptures, and I think you will be uh, well served to be able to read those along with us, uh, perhaps in, in your own Bible as well. Maybe you want to make some notes or something like that. If you have your Bibles, I'll be taking uh, four verses for a text today. We'll begin in Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. Then we'll move to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. And then we'll go to Galatians 5, 24. And we'll end up in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. So if you have your Bibles, Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. When you found it, would you stand please for the reading of God's word? Thank you. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now if you have your opening, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. And our last text verse, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that today these verses might be linked together and that we, O oh Lord, might understand what is set before us. I pray that the thrust of this message would hit the mark. And I pray, O oh Lord, that in each of our lives we would understand that you have done so much for us, and yet you require something of us. And I pray that we could we commit ourselves to that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I will use for a title today, No Stay of Execution. No Stay of Execution. Oh, the humanity of man. I do, not believe, I do believe that we are more tied to our humanity than an animal is its animality or beastliness. It is quite common for a variety of animals to take on human-like mannerisms and activities. But we as humans seem to struggle quite seriously to release our humanity so that we may become a little more like Christ. First of all, this morning, I, I want to review information that you undoubtedly already know. I, I say that you know it, you know it at least in the empirical sense. God, of course, is not surprised by our attachment to our humanity. Jesus acknowledged the power that our humanness exercises over us in his conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. In John chapter 3 and verse 6, Jesus says to Nicodemus, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So powerful and obstinate is the flesh that what is born flesh stays flesh. It is impossible for flesh to be changed into any other state. You can anoint it with oil. 
baptize it in water, feed it communion, subject it to prayer and the study of the scriptures, take it to church, send it to seminary, hang a clerical collar upon it, and even canonize it. But after all of that, it is still flesh. This is the reason that salvation doesn't change or reconfigure our bodies. It is the spirit inside of these bodies that salvation changes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we are familiar with the passage, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. All things are become new. But even though we accept Christ and attempt every moment to live in his righteousness, our flesh, a metaphor for carnality, remains to try us. It is this remaining carnality that causes us to be tempted by sin. The word flesh is one that is often used in the New Testament to refer to all the proclivities and evil tendencies by which men are so often overcome. In order for me to be assured that you understand the concept of the word flesh as used in the New Testament, I want to expose you to Paul's list of the works of the flesh. The list that he gives us is not exhaustive. Much more could be added. Nevertheless, it establishes a baseline for us whereby we may recognize any feelings or desires of carnality in ourselves. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19, he, we read, The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. These things are the carnal cravings of humanity, and they will remain tempters and temptresses to us as long as we remain in this earthly rim. The spirit of man, the spirit of man, much of the time is passive. The flesh, however, is not. We know this from the words that Jesus spake to his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night of his arrest when they could not pray for sleeping. You'll remember that Jesus said to them in Matthew 26, 41, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Paul alerts us to the struggle that often takes place within the believer, writing in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17, the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. The flesh is drawn to carnality like flies are to honey. And if carnal flesh is not kept in check by the spirit of the living God inside of the believer, that flesh will again rise to dominance in one or many areas of the believer's life. I want you to take notice of the four verses that I chose for my text because in those verses, many people would see a contradiction. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, we read where Paul said, Our old man is crucified with him. This verse declares that our old man, that is us before we accepted Christ, is crucified with Christ. Many understand this to mean that the old man is dead. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Here Paul declares, the old me is dead. It was crucified on the cross with Christ. It's interesting, though, to note that Paul might have been crucified with Christ, but he did not die there. It was several months later before the old Paul collapsed on the road to Damascus and died in a house on Straight Street. Listen to what Paul writes in the last two chapters of our text, the last two scriptures of our text. In 5 and 24 of Galatians, he writes, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, he exhorts, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Well, now this is interesting, is it not? We have two verses that says the flesh was crucified on the cross with Christ, and we have two verses that exhorts us to do what the first two verses proclaim has already been done. What kind of death is it 
that strikes its victim and yet allows that victim to run around and continue to live for months before he or she finally dies. In Paul's case, it was months before the old Paul finally died, months after the crucifixion. In our case, and in the believers between us and Paul, it has been centuries, even millennia, where the believer has still had to contend with the flesh and carnality. It's still alive. But, but if we believe the inspiration of Scripture and the continuity of Scripture, which I do, I do not see in these verses a contradiction that makes me doubt Rather, I realize when I come to these verses that I do not understand these passages yet. This is what every Christian has to do when we are confronted with scriptures that we cannot understand or reconcile. It takes humility to admit, I don't understand, and tenacity to study with the intent to understand. But this is what we should be doing as Christians when the passage seems vague or contradictory. So, so was the flesh crucified with Christ thousands of years ago? If so, why am I still bothered with it? Is crucifying or putting to death the flesh something that I as a believer must do? Let's approach this topic with some important information. It's vital for every believer to understand that the carnality of the flesh will never die a natural death. Let me say that again. The carnality of the flesh will never die of natural causes. It does not matter how much you pray, fast, read your Bible, go to church, do charity work, the carnality of the flesh will not die a natural death. Ask any aged saint and they will tell you that after years of Christian living, pursuit of God, The carnality of the flesh still attacks and seeks to allure them into that which is unholy. You see, carnality is not diminished with age. In fact, if one is not careful, it becomes stronger as the years pass. And could I tell you that old carnality is the worst of the lot? Maybe you are here and you're a little on the, on the younger side of life and, and you're struggling with some things and you think, well, if I can just wait it out and not make a major screw up till I get old, this thing will finally pass. I'm here to tell you carnality never passes. It remains. It plagues. It becomes a thorn in the flesh. It will never die a natural death. In Revelations, we find a word that is relevant today to our thought, and that is the word overcometh. It appears seven times in the first three chapters. The word overcometh is used in Christ's message to the seven churches of Asia, most of which he rebukes for their carnality and exhorts them to overcome it. The word overcome in this context demands that there be opposition and counter-opposition. It requires mastery. The opposition must be crushed. The overcomer must swing the sword before he wears the crown. The carnality of the flesh will not die a natural death. You will not awake one morning to ri- or rise from your knees of prayer one day and find that miraculously carnality has fled never to return. The key to understanding the questions already set forth, which I will deal with, in a bit more detail shortly, is found in the forbearance of God and the free will of man. I want you to keep those two things in mind as we progress. The forbearance of God and the free will of man. So let's look at the first question that I posed, and it was this. Was the believer's carnal flesh crucified with Christ thousands of years ago? One must understand that believers do not become superheroes when they accept Christ. Believers are human, and they remain human even after conversion. This means that believers are limited in their strength to resist temptation just like all the rest of humanity are. While it is true that some may have more self-control than others, Self-control in and of itself is not sufficient to put carnality to death. 
the reason that carnality had the reason is that car is that carnality has its origins in the fallen nature of man. We are infected, eat up with carnality. Our human nature is one that has been inflamed by a chronic infection of satanic rebellion against God. Satan fell because of rebellion. He seduced Eve, she seduced Adam, and though and through that seduction, Satan transmitted his rebellion and carnality to the human race. So if mankind was to have a chance at overcoming fleshly carnality, it required an intervention of deity. Man cannot defeat Satan in his own strength. Even believers cannot best Satan, and the enemy within carnality cannot be beaten in our own strength. The good news is that deity did intervene. Christ came, fought the fight with Satan, overcame him, and carnality with him. On the cross, a mortal blow was delivered to carnality. After the cross, it is no longer superior to man, but in fact, it has become subject to believers who are filled with the Holy Spirit. The forces of heaven in that day fought against carnality on the behalf of men and defeated it at Calvary. This brings us to our second question. Well, if our old man or if carnality was crucified with Christ thousands of years ago, why am I still bothered with it? This is where the forbearance of God and the free will of man take center stage. It was never God's intent to force his holiness upon man. God, even in the case of redemption, allows men to choose to believe or not. It is true, a fountain has been opened for sin and uncleanness. Nevertheless, God forces no one to partake. And the same is true of Christ's defeat of carnality. We automatically assume when we read verses like those of Romans 6 and 6 and Galatians 2 and 20 that carnality, being crucified with Christ, is dead. This fact the fact is that the scriptures do not teach that in these passages or anywhere else. Our text only says that the old man carnality was crucified with Christ. Not that carnality died with Christ. If carnality had died with Christ, it would seem that Christ was then the source of carnality. And we know that can never be so. We assume that because Jesus died from his crucifixion, that carnality must have died also. But my assistance, ladies and gentlemen, is not needed to prove to you that such a belief is wrong. You see for yourselves, my brothers and sisters, how carnality is far from dead. It is very much alive. In every fiber of our society, fleshly carnality thrives and exerts itself. You know, as do I, that carnality is a constant foe for us believers. It's, it is not a significant portion of our time spent in either resisting it or submitting to it. But Jesus did something on the cross to carnality that is very much in line with what he has done to other enemies of humankind. Watch this. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we have the proto-evangelium where God declares that the seed of the woman, Christ, will bruise or crush the serpent's head. Well, now, a truly crushed head is a mortal blow. And yet we know that Satan, though wounded, is still alive and active. The same pattern is traceable in another enemy of mankind, death. Christ, by his resurrection, conquered death and took away its sting, severely crippling it in the process. And yet in our world, we have been reminded, death is still alive and active. If we consider Christ's method of dealing with Satan and death, we are able to better see what stratagem he used concerning carnality. On the cross, 
He dealt carnality such a blow that its power has been greatly diminished. Whereas before Christ, men had little hope of triumphing over fleshly carnality. Now, because of what Jesus did to carnality of the cross, the believer now has the upper hand in his struggle. The battle has been tilted in our favor because of what Christ did on the cross. Let me share a little story with you that happened to my father-in-law some years ago. In the area where my father-in-law lived, they have rattlesnakes. And I'm not talking about little rattlesnakes. Some of them are as big as your arm. They are huge. One day he was out disking up his garden. And some way or another he uncovered one of the things. And he said it was striking at his tractor. Just, And he, he got off the tractor and he beat its head in and thought he killed it and left it for dead. A little while later... He went outside, and the rattlesnake was gone. He began to look around, and that rattlesnake was still alive and had crawled a good distance away. This is carnality. We think we have bashed in its brains. We have rendered it inoperable. We have killed it, and yet it lives. Now, we can see this when we consider our text in Romans 6 and 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, not dead. This text does not say our old man died with him. It said the old man was crucified with him. Watch this. That the body of sin might be destroyed. Do I need to read that for you again, or are you following my nuances? Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, and that the body body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Paul says that Christ's blow against carnality on the cross was done so that the body of sin might be destroyed. Carnality may be overcome, by any believer who is willing to do so. But the fact remains that God forces no one to part with carnality against their will. Men must choose whether or not to resist or submit to their individual carnality. This leads us to consider our next question, which was this. Is crucifying or putting to death the flesh something that I as a believer must do? It is a fact that since carnality is not dead, only being severely weakened and vulnerable, if the believer does not take it upon himself to consistently crucify his or her flesh, carnality, though wounded and weakened as it may be, will still dominate the life of the believer. As strange as it may sound, I'm here to confirm that there is such a thing as carnal Christians. We wish it were not so, but we dare not deny what we experience and witness so routinely. Carnal Christians are those whose lives are dominated by the works of the flesh instead of the fruits of the Spirit. You see, these good brothers and sisters have taken for granted that they have no continuing role to play in resisting carnality or putting it to death. They believe that carnality died on the cross with Christ even though the facts does not affirm this in their lives or in the world. Now, I do not condemn or slander these believers. God knows how often I, found my, I have found myself as one of their company. But the fact is that these believers are often quite confused and despondent. They don't want to be carnal, but yet they are, and they don't know what's happening. Carnality was... was crucified on the cross with Christ. It died with Christ, but I'm still being bothered with it. And so they're quite disturbed that carnality's ghost still haunts and dominates them. They lack this truth that I'm preaching today. The truth that Christ started the work. He weakened and wounded carnality at the cross. Carnality is now weaker than the believer who is filled with the Spirit. In fact, it may be overcome by a saint if he's determined to triumph. 
I wish now to lay before you a few things that must happen in order for you as the believer to finish your job in defeating carnality. The first one is carnality must be arrested. Here are the facts. Our carnal fleshly natures were nailed to the cross with Christ, but each of us has taken him down since and set him free. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, we read, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And since carnality obtained his freedom, ladies and gentlemen, he is at large. We probably have seen him or heard or encountered him just this morning. Before carnality can be put to death in our lives, he must be arrested. The method for arresting carnality is given to us by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 where he said, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Carnality must be arrested, and the sooner you apprehend him, the better for you. If you're on the hunt for him, here's a tip. His favorite hangout is in the mine. He can be found there at various times. It's a place that he frequents daily. But a word of caution, do not think that he will be taken without a struggle. He is a desperate villain that has escaped justice time and again, and he plans to do the same thing this time. He will not go willingly to the execution site. He must be marched there, drugged there by force. The second thing you must know if you're going to kill carnality is this. You must refuse to listen to his pleas for tolerance. Carnality is a very persuasive con. And in times where he loses the upper hand, he can become downright pitiful. He will reason with you, plead and object, advance arguments as to why he is not the villain and to why you should be concerned, should not be concerned with him. He will deny his own identity by assuming the guise of any virtue or basic right or privilege to which we as humanity feel entitled. Carnality often poses as the pursuit of happiness. He sometimes goes by the name of justice. He will invoke God, the scriptures, common sense, and in our case, even the Constitution. In his effort to escape justice, You must not listen to him or you will be deceived by him again. There is no need to check his identity. Again, you you identified him right the first time. There is no doubt this is your man. The third thing you must do to defeat carnality, you must bring him to the execution spot, the foot of Christ's cross. There is no other place where he can be crucified anew other than the foot of Calvary's cross. Beware of his guile now. Carnality will try to persuade you to let him go to rehab, but that cannot be. Remember, you've let him do this many times before, and he never reforms. In fact, when he gets out, he's worse than ever before. He will beg you to just send him into exile. This too you cannot allow because he always finds his way back. And finally, you yourself must strike the death blow. Arrest carnality. There's no need for a trial. Christ has already condemned him. He is a fugitive from justice. Lay him low, lift the hammer, drive the nail. For every individual infraction, he must be crucified again. As long as we are in these bodies, he must be crucified. This is why Paul could say that the old man is dead 
in Christ. It wasn't because Christ killed it once and for all on the Calvary. You'll remember Paul says in another place, I die daily. This is the reason Paul could say the old man was dead. He didn't believe that carnality died with Jesus on the cross, but he had taken advantage of what Christ did on the cross, and he was daily defeating carnality in his own life because Christ had weakened it. And therefore he could say the old man is dead. As long as we are in our bodies, we will struggle with carnality. Oh, but at last... By God's grace, we shall overcome. Christ has given carnality a deadly wound. Now it is up to us to give him the coup de grace. This must be done daily. For the believer, every day is execution day. Would you stand over the building? Lord Jesus, you know our humanity. Even as the psalm, psalmist declares, you know our frame. You remember that we are just us. And yet, Lord Jesus, you don't, do not despise our flesh. But in our weakness, you have intervened. Striking carnality, so fierce a blow that now we may conquer him. He's no more the formidable champion of human nature. So I pray that we will not harbor this fugitive from your justice. Let us hold him accountable for every infraction. Let us regularly drag him to your cross and there destroy his hold on our souls. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Are you in this room today? And you've been thoroughly confused. I hope not by my sermon, I hope you was confused about the theology of the passages. And you'll realize, I do have a part to play. I can't just float through my spiritual life and wonder why God doesn't take carnality. Wonder why I'm still bothered with it. I have a role to play. Christ has made it possible that I don't have to live in carnality anymore. And pastor, I want you to pray for me that I can strike him the blow in my life every time he presents himself so that Christ can be alive and triumph in me. Can I see your hand if that's you? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. It can be done, ladies and gentlemen. It can be done. Father, in the name of Jesus, touch my brothers and my sisters. May this truth, O oh God, resonate in our souls may we no longer be passive confused distraught because of carnality let us not hide from him like the Israelites did Goliath every time that giant of carnality opens his mouth or raises his head help us to realize we have the power to arrest him we have the power to drag him to the foot of the cross. We have the power to drive the nails, to put him to death because you have conquered the world. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Brother Ford, lead us in a course while we contemplate for just a moment. Lead me to the cross where you love poor Bring me to my knees, Lord. Lord, I lay, lay me down. Rid me of myself. I, I belong, belong to you. Oh, lead me. Lead me, lead me 
to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Lead me. Hallelujah. Lead me to the cross. Remember tonight at 515, prayer, 530, evening service. Would you raise your hand for the blessing? The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I place upon you the name of the Lord. May his blessings rest upon you now and always. Amen and amen. God bless you.